All right, so let us carry on with the last remaining slides. If you're following along in the book, um, these last couple uh, lectures have kind of gotten all out of order. I'm really glad that I don't write a textbook. I think the hardest part would be organizing them and rearranging them. So there's some specific topics left and they don't necessarily go in order as to how they're laid out in the textbook. Um, I tried to put them in order, the slides, you know, in the way that they make sense to me, but apparently they don't, the, the publishers of the book don't think they make sense to them in the same order. Um, but this image here, uh, or an image of the same research project, I'm on page 169, and this is, I do ask you a question about what is the implication of Harlow and his monkeys. Um, and the, the monkey, or this research was done, I want to say it's done in the 40s, and it was interested in understanding, um, so this is right after the Second World War, and there was an, there's an abundance of neglected babies around the world, and babies were, you know, in uh, orphanages, and they were just putting the bottle, you know, in the crib, and this was problematic for some people. They didn't think this was right, and so Harlow was doing some research um, and measuring the if food basically measuring what would the question was would the baby would these baby monkeys i think they're mechanic monkeys would they respond would they would they respond to the food or to the comfort right so he's measuring uh, the relationship between contact comfort and food this terry cloth baby mother and this is a wire mother but only the wire mother has food and so the question was, so these babies in these orphanages were, you know, being fed, but they weren't being held. And was this going to matter? You know, what's the role of mothers in this, in this question, this context? And so this is a classic experiment, and I should just, I'll tell you the answer. Um, but the baby, the monkeys spent the majority of their time with the monkeys, with the, with the terry cloth monkey. They would cross over and hang out with the wire monkey to get the food, but they would always come back to the terry cloth monkey. And so he sets up some experiments where he scares the, the babies. He brings in this machine, you know, that makes all this loud noise. And what did the, ter what did the monkey do with the baby? But the baby went to the terry cloth monkey. And, and what he concluded was that for, that the mother Mother's role was more than just food. Parents do more than just provide food for their children, but it's through the contact comfort of soothing. And this, going back to an earlier lecture um, about failure to thrive, right? This is thought to be one of the um, uh, one of the causes of the failure to thrive is that babies need to be held and tended to and responded to with more than just fed. Um, there's also a brief discussion about the role of fathers and the only thing, so this might be a little unpopular um, in, some, in some circles, but the role of father from an academic perspective is a social construct. In other words, there is no biological uh, definition of good, of, of good father, that each culture decides for itself what a good father is and what the role of the father should be. Um, in some cases, there is not really a father figure to play, but the male influence is, uh, or maybe there isn't a male influence at all, right? It may be the mother's brother or uh, they may simply live, boys may simply live with all the other children in a community of women. So what each culture decides as uh, what father is and what father should do is culturally specific. Um, in the marriage and family literature, though, there's an awful lot of information. There's a lot, a lot of research that says that in our culture and Western cultures, fathers want to be more involved with their children and that often moms act as kind of a gatekeeper. So sometimes moms make it difficult for fathers to have the role, the relationships that they want with their children because moms do this thing um, where the, the father has to do it like, like, let me show you, let me mother show you how to take care of the children. Or we use language like fathers are babysitting their kids right, or helping mom out around the house. And in the social sociology side, 
we would advocate that fathers don't help raise their kids. They like raise their kids. Fathers don't babysit any more than moms babysit, right? Dads can do it just as well as mom can, moms can do it. But that's, that's part of our cultural construct of, of those mother father relationships. But the research does really support that fathers want to be a part um, and our culture kind of makes that more difficult. And uh, yeah, and ultimately it's easier to take care of kids if you have somebody to share that responsibility with. Okay, um, I'm not really gonna get into the whole discussion, I should because I have an assignment, but I'm not really gonna get into too much of the discussion of gender. Um, sex and gender are not the same thing. Sex is your biology, gender is how you think about yourself and how you interact with the world. Gender typing, um, refers to, in this case, we're talking about how parents treat their girls differently than they treat their boys, all the way from the language that they use to describe them, to the toys they give them, to the colors they dress them in, to how long they let them cry. Research sociologists have demonstrated that if that we will let our girl babies cry longer than we'll let our boy babies cry, it's like we don't like our boys to cry, we'll let our toddler boys wander further away from us than we will little girls. We want to keep our girls closer to us. Uh, we talk more to our little girls than we talk to our little boys. And all of these things, they argue, or, social, or, or researchers argue, are part of how they grow up, how boys and girls grow up to think of themselves differently. Because at birth, there's not really very many differences, right? Their weights are not really different, their brain size, um, none of that stuff is really very different. They become different over time. Um, okay, so this is a chapter on, like I said, there's some random ideas here. This is a chapter on uh, the self and probably should have gone back there when we were talking about emotions. But what's important to keep in mind about the construction of the self is that this requires a level of cognitive development. Uh, there is a classic research project, and I believe I asked you about this one on the quiz too, the Rouge Test of Self-Awareness. Um, and uh, this is one of the things that they, uh, the researchers have compared humans with animals. And the experiment goes, well, you could watch it, but I'll tell you about it. The experiment goes like this, that a toddler, I think it was before 18 months, so a 16 month old, you could, what you do is you put like rouge on their nose and a red spot. And a 16 month old will see themselves in the mirror and it, they'll, they won't even realize that's them in the mirror. But the 18 month old, if you put um, rouge on their nose, they know that's their nose. And we, we know that by, that they will try to wipe it off. Was it a, there was some research with an animal and I want to say it was a monkey or something. And was, they put the red on the top of their ears and these uh, animals recognize themselves in the mirror. And when they saw this red, they go to touch it. So the idea is that if you know that's you in the mirror and you know you're not supposed to have this red spot on your nose and so you'll touch it and you'll wipe it away but if you don't know that's you in the mirror then you won't try to wipe it away right you might touch the mirror oh see you might touch the mirror um, but you won't touch you because the spot is in the mirror not on you i hope that makes sense um also somewhere around these these toddler years you have the next crisis this is erickson's crisis and this one is the crisis of autonomy versus shame um, and that's the shift from, what's it say, external control to self-control, right? Um, and this is, we call it the negative two or the terrible twos, because that's what children are learning. They are learning about how much of themselves and how much of the world can they control, right? And so this is very frustrating to parents because all of a sudden these sweet little pleasant children don't want to are constantly saying no, 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 because they're struggling with this autonomy versus shame and doubt. Can I control my own world, right? Can I learn autonomy? Take that apart. Auto, auto me means can I do it myself or do I not have my ability to control? So to help to help children transition through this stage, we create opportunities for two-year-olds 
to take some control over their environment and take some control over themselves, right? We give them choices so that they learn about autonomy and that they learn that they, they do have some control. Unfortunately, if you get through that age and you've not learned how to take, how, how to, that you can influence what happens to you, this can lead you to things like, you know, external locus of control and that's a bunch of other stuff. Okay, so this is a slide I stuck in because all of these terms are in your textbook and I wanted to make sure that we'd at least, that I'd at least mention them. Um, basically what's happening all the way through the life course is this process of socialization. That's chapter three in sociology. Um, but socialization is how you learn about the rules, right? The, the rules about being a member or being a part of this culture, of this society. Internalization simply means that you've that you have internalized the rules right and part of internalizing part of learning about your place is you learn how to regulate your own emotional response when we were talking about emotions and how i suggested that we learn through the socializing of emotions what our emotions are and how we're supposed to express them. Oh, this feeling is fear and I'm not supposed to hit when I'm afraid or this is anger and I have to use my words, part of socialization. The development of consciousness. So consciousness is, if I can think of like use Freud's idea, this is consciousness is like the internalization of the rules of culture. Right. And um, developmental psychologists use these three different kinds of development of, I don't know if they're levels of consciousness, but they're the degree to which you embrace the rules. Right. You have or and they use the term compliance. So you have situational compliance. And these are we start to see this in children. We start to see this in three year olds. Right. Um, and these are children. And this is when a child will follow the rules when they're reminded. So they'll, they'll comply um, when they're told to or when someone's watching, perhaps, right? You have committed compliance, and these are kids that have internalized the rules, and they're going to do it if you're there or not to remind them. They just know the rules, right? Um, and then you have receptive cooperation. And these are this is a situation where not only have children internalized the rules, but they are actually facilitating it. So they're helping their caregiver, um, what's to say, help, helping with their agenda. So they're not following the rules per se, but it's almost like they're participating. I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, uh, maybe feeding the dogs, right? Feeding the dogs. So they can, they help feed the dogs. Um, and when they accidentally spill some kibble on the floor and their parent says, please pick up the kibble off the floor. Okay. They do that when they remember, when they're reminded. Um, and then committed compliance is they always pick up the kibble. Their parents don't have to remind them, but in the receptive compliance and the receptive cooperation, perhaps, they even help their parents. Maybe their parents spill kibble and so they pick up the kibble to help their parents without their parents having to remind them that they, that's kind of what, that, that's kind of a, not the best example, but I think you know, I think you can kind of get what I'm talking about, right? So they go along with their agenda without having to be, or maybe like doing the dishes or helping their parents do their dishes. Their parent doesn't have to tell them to do the dishes or rinse out the milk glass, but they rinse out the milk glass for their parent, right? That kind of thing. But they're the different levels or the different degrees, if you will, of internalizing the rules and that's really what consciousness is at least from a psychological perspective is consciousness is that internalization of the cultural expectations there is a brief discussion in your book about um, the effects of maternal employment i think this is a quiz question too give me one uh, positive and one negative about them um, there are some some advantages are down here um, the research tells us over and over again, the kids who go to daycare learn language faster um, than kids who don't. Um, they may learn other bad problems too. They may pick up other kids' negative behaviors. They often develop 
the social skills of interaction. Certainly this is true for only children that don't have daycare and don't have any other children to interact with. Um, but this also could make them, as I say, stress and behavior problems. Um, it can be stressful to move around. A couple things to think about with daycare is it is incredibly expensive if you can find it. Um, some research suggests that it is as expensive as college tuition for full-time daycare. Uh, not all daycares are the same. Um, there are things to consider, what we call structure. So that means what kind of setting it's in, uh, what the ratio of caregivers to kids, how many of the caregivers turn over, uh, all of those things. And then process has to do with how the caregivers actually do the caring, right? Is it developmentally appropriate? Uh, do they use discipline? Like, do they use punishment or discipline? Uh, is there a schedule? Um, what kind of activity, what kind of things are happening there? What are the actions? Uh, and not all daycares work for all kinds of kids. You might have different temperaments, uh, different attachments, uh, but then again, you might not be able to find daycare at all. I, I don't know, maybe somebody can tell me in one of the discussions, what's the current situation in daycare with all this COVID stuff? Is it harder to find? My guess is it probably is, and there's more people who need it um, than before, so that means the prices could go up. I mean, I just, I just my heart, uh, goes out to everybody who's got small children who's trying to or school age kids or kids that can't stay home by themselves with all of this stuff right now. It's just such a challenging time for people. And you know, and then people try to work from home with their kids in the background. I heard a podcast this morning and they were saying that, you know, the stay at home mom or this work from home she was full-time employed and she was taking care of her four-year-old and she says she just feels like she's doing it all bad do the best you can anyway that's a digression and then there's a brief discussion about maltreatment uh, some of them we've already talked about i've spoken briefly about shaken baby syndrome and this is when there's head and nerve damage caused by shaking the baby um, and then non-organic failure to thrive. So this is where the, the, there doesn't seem to be a cause for the baby not growing. Um, we have the difference between neglect and physical, uh, physical maltreatment and emotional maltreatment and neglect and neglect appears to be much more common. Um, it's probably the most common of all of these maltreatments on the list. And it, boy, it goes back to that attach, the discussion on attachment, the discussion on emotional management. Um, it's based on the, the inability or the lack of, again, what's called serve and return. That means a child expresses they serve and then the caregiver returns or well yeah because I mean yeah they, they the reciprocal um, interaction that child has with caregiver where they learn language and they learn emotional management and they learn all of these they learn attachment all because they expressed they served and they were reciprocated and they returned there is a brief discussion. Uh, I always get mixed feelings about this because, again, I'm a sociologist, but there's a brief discussion about the characteristics of, of, of households or families, I don't remember the exact words, that are more likely to um, be characterized by maltreatment. I don't want to emphasize this. Like I said, I got mixed feelings about it because if you look at this list, you know, it makes it, it, it sounds like if you're poor and uneducated that you're gonna maltreat your kids. And that's just not the case, right? You can be poor and you can be uneducated and, do, and be a great parent. That's not the case. But what they, all these things have in common, right? Poverty, limited education, social isolation. What they all have in common is a lack of other people to help and a lack of if I'm getting stressed out because I can't pay my bills, because I don't understand this paperwork, because uh, if I'm getting stressed out, it's hard to parent. So it's not lack of education and it's not being poor. It's being alone. It's not having someone or a group or a church or friends or family to help you when you need help. That is 
what all of these things boil down to. They all boil down to you don't have someone to help and the only tool you have available is this culture, because it also talks about violence, but is this cultural, aggressive sort of mindset. So what do you do? If you can't, if you can't figure it out, you resort, uh, you may resort to not doing anything or you may resort to physical punishment. I hope that makes some sense. Well, this ends uh, this lecture video and this um, topic, which is the first three years. And I'm not sure which chapter I'm, we're gonna go to next. So um, stay tuned and thank you for listening.